large and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to another worship experience here at St. Thomas Missionary Baptist Church. Whether you're seated in the sanctuary or you're viewing us via Facebook, we say welcome for the day we come again to lift up the name of Jesus. Today we come to tell the Lord thank you. Today we come to bless his name. Amen. Amen. Our choir is going to come and lead us now further in worship through song.
Crazy day, right? Yeah. Mm hmm Come on, men, man. Is y'all supposed to be the award-winning, what? Saint male, male choir? Yeah. Come on, bring it on down to it. If Robin can do it, you can do it too. Yeah. Praise his name. You know, this morning we were talking in the book of Galatians, in the sixth chapter, and we're dealing with uh, a lot of things that Christians shouldn't, shouldn't be in Christians, you know. We should walk in the spirit, you know. And uh, talking about uh, all these different sins that people commit, and 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 and, uh, and and then it talks about the fruit of the spirit. That's where we are. We got to let the fruit of the spirit operate in our lives each and every day, you yeah. know. And uh, uh, but you know, with all the stuff that's going on in the world today, not just here in Jackson or around, but there's one thing that people is getting, and that's the spirit of unforgiveness. You kill my son. You kill my mama. You kill my cousin. I'll never forgive you. And that's just flowing, flowing throughout a whole lot of places. I'll never forgive you, you know, because of what you did to me. And that spirit of unforgiveness is, is, is something that's going to hurt a lot, a lot, a lot of people. So we got to be careful of that. And we got to pray that God will, uh, will bless them and Give them the spirit of love and joy and peace and long suffering, because that's rough on a lot of people. You know what they're doing, uh, and it, it, it's like I know somebody who can help them. You know, I know somebody that can help people that are going through things like that. And his name is what Jesus, and that's who we gotta ask Jesus to help these people for be able to forgive. Don't let Satan tie them up in this way. Uh, it's just like that old, when we were in nursery uh, school, but we used to hear this nursery rhyme go something like this. Humpty Dumpty sit on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king horses and all the king men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Y'all remember that? But I know somebody who could have helped Humpty Dumpty? <laughs> and his name is Jesus. Yeah. Who can wash away your sin? Who can make you whole again? And that's Jesus. Yeah. Jesus can help him. Yeah. So if you find yourself in that situation, or you know somebody that's in that situation who's been broken because of something, go 
Go to the Father and pray for it. Well, today, as we go into prayer, uh, is there anyone here that have somebody that need prayer this morning? Anyone? Huh? Thomas? Easily. Thomas Easily. Anybody else? Anybody else? You can come down if you so desire. Thomas Easily. We want to remember him this morning when we pray. All right, as we sing. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just to the Father. Father, we come in your presence in the name of Jesus. Magnify you today, Father. With all of our heart and all our body, mind, soul, and strength, we love you, Father. Everything in us, Father, we praise you with it. We love you today because you are the God of all creation. We magnify you, Father, because you're the only one that can do things that nobody else can do. You can open doors that no man can open. You can close doors that no man can close, Father. Now, there are doors that we are asking you to open this morning. And there are doors that we are asking you to close this morning, Father. We're asking now, Father, that you would just look upon those who are having trouble in their body. In the name of call out Mr. Thomas this morning, Father. We ask you to move in a mighty way and bless him, Father. Father, there are other names that are calling out this morning that people that we know that are sick or bereaved families or different things that are going on in their lives, Father. We ask you to comfort. We ask you to heal. We ask you to save. We ask you to deliver, Father, because we know, Father, that you're able to do all these things because of Jesus. Father, it's able to happen to us because Jesus came one day and he gave his life. And on the third day he rose and he declared that he had all power. His blood is, can wash us from all of our sins, Father. And all that came to him were healed. They were made whole in the name of Jesus. We magnify you today, Father. Bless this service, Father. This last Sunday, Father, and this month, Father, we ask that you continue to walk with us each and every day, everywhere we go. And everything that we do, Father, we ask that your presence be around us, Father, that we might not do those things, Father, that are displeasing in your sight, Father. Oh, we ask that you continue to help us to grow, Father, in wisdom and knowledge and understanding and faith and all those things, Father. Help us, Father, for we need your help this morning. We magnify you today because we are your sons, and we magnify you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this day. Oh, he's so wonderful. Yes, he is. Glory, 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 glory. We are continuing. Thank you for your gifts that you've given to this ministry uh, because there are things that need to be done here and, and we're asking that you continue to give. We couldn't do it without you. So this morning as we uh, bless those offerings and those gifts. Will you raise your hand with me? Father, we, we thank you, Father, for the gifts that were given, seeds that were planted, and the things that your people are doing, Father, to promote this ministry here, Father. We give you thanks for them. We bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
have to wake me this morning. Yes. But I'm glad you did. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. Amen. Thank this male choir for blessing us today. In song. Amen. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with us to the Gospel of Matthew? Matthew chapter 5. We want to lift up one verse, and that's verse number 13. Matthew chapter 5, 13. If you don't have your Bibles, it's there on the screen. These words we find recorded. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. The words of God for the people of God. I want to talk with you this morning from the subject, the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. You know, sodium chloride, which is salt, gets a lot of bad press. It is blamed for everything from hypertension to obesity to heart disease. And the need for salt is questioned. Its use is discouraged and its presence on many tables is often more decorative than anything else. Can y'all hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> this was not the case when Jesus announced to his disciples that you are the salt of the earth. And in the cultural world of the ancient uh, Near East or Middle East, salt was essential and valuable. For example, the Roman government often paid their soldiers wages in salt. And a good, faithful man was said to be worth his salt. In fact, our English word salary comes from the Latin word salarium, which means to trade or barter with salt. Salt served a wide array of purposes in the ancient world. And interestingly... Scholars has just or have just as many interpretations of what Jesus meant by this statement about salt in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. But of all the possible meanings, there are three primary interpretations that deserve our attention. First of all, salt prevents decay. In the ancient East, families did not have refrigerators or freezers to prevent meat from spoiling, they would pack it in salt. And the salt would slow down the process of spoiling. That is what is meant for Christians to be the salt of the earth. The presence of the saints in a world is a sovereign act of restraining grace because we are the salt of the earth and without which the forces of evil would have little or no resistance in the world. And then secondly, salt promotes thirst. When you intake a lot of salt, you become thirsty. And that is what is meant for Christians to be the salt of the earth. We ought to live in such a way that we cause people to be dissatisfied with the passing pleasures of the world and to become thirsty for the living word of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus says in the same way, let your light 
shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And the most obvious use of salt in both the ancient and modern world is that of a flavoring agent. Salt provides flavor. It seasons. It makes things taste better. And one little boy said, salt is what, is what makes food taste bad when it's not on it. And I believe this. I believe this is a primary point that Jesus makes when he says, you are the salt of the earth. And the latter part of that verse supports this. As Jesus warns about the consequences of salt losing its flavor, Christians are to the earth what salt is to food. And as salt makes food taste better, followers of Jesus Christ are to influence this sinful world for the kingdom of God. We are to be kingdom condiments. We are to be sanctified seasoning. We are to add godly flavoring to this insipid world and to be the salt of the earth that Christ called us to be. We must live our lives for God, not for this world, we are the salt of the earth, but we are salt mostly and more importantly for God. We live for the pleasure of God in order to make a difference in this sinful world. And here's the issue. God is holy. This world is sinful. And our holy God cannot tolerate sin. So he left the church on earth to salt it so that he can tolerate this sinful world. And of course, that does not mean that Christians are perfect. Rather, we are people who have experienced the goodness of God in Christ and who, as consequence, live to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The presence of citizens of the kingdom of heaven makes this corrupt world palatable to the holiness of God. We are the salt of the earth. And this principle is illustrated Throughout scripture, we see this in Noah in the flood, Joseph in Potiphar's house. We see this in Lot in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. We see it in Paul and the pagan sailors who were shipwrecked with him. And we ultimately see this in the church of Jesus Christ. We are the salt. Y'all stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Because it's important to understand who you are and whose you are. We are again the salt of the earth, but we are living in a sinful world. And we are living and serving and representing the kingdom as Christ has called us to. And one writer wrote, for too long, we have been tickling palates with fancy flavors, spicy relishes, and clever recipes borrowed from the world. In other words, we've been doing too much stuff like the world is doing. And too many pulpits serve gourmet theology with menus from Hollywood, and they're trying to please the jaded appetites of the fed up humanity. But what we really need is some old-fashioned salt. And if we do not start producing more of it in our churches, we shall be good for nothing. I stand to let the church 
be the church. And what is the church? You are the salt of the earth. And in the scientific chart of elements, salt is sodium chloride. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus gives us the place of salt in the kingdom of elements. Jesus describes his followers as salt of the earth. And if you are a child of God, that's who you are. You are the salt of the earth. The first two words in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 are crucial because it says you are. And these two words tell us that this statement is a description, not a prescription. It is not a command or an exhortation. Jesus is not challenging his followers to some ideal behavior. He is simply stating the nature of kingdom citizenship. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus does not say you should be salt. Does not promise you will be salt. Does not command you to be salt. Does not exhort us to act like salt. Does not encourage us to strive for saltiness. And he doesn't exhort us to pray that God will make us salt. He says, you are the salt of the earth. And in this statement, our function as salt is assumed, but our nature as salt is explicit. In fact, it's emphatic. You and only you are the salt of the earth. The fact that Jesus says salt is what you are, makes a vital point about maximizing kingdom influence. And the Lord considers who you are to be more important than what you do. And the Lord is only pleased with what you do when it flows from who you are. Whew. In many instances, churches emphasize performance and they ignore character. We give positions of influence to people based on their talents, their longevity, or connections, and we fail to factor in the things that matters the most, like conversion experience, spiritual vitality, Christian maturity, Biblical qualifications, godly wisdom, moral purity, and Christ-like humanity. But God will not settle for salt substitutes. God is not as concerned with your gifts, talents, and abilities as he is, watch this, your holiness, your godliness, and your Christ-likeness. And with God, character precedes and predetermines performance. Let me say that one again. With God, character precedes and predetermines performance. In other words, if you are saved, people ought not have to beg you to work in church. If you are saved, people ought not have to beg you to show up on God's program. If you are saved, nobody has to play Simon Says with you and say, let us come on, praise God. You ought to have a relationship with him to the point where nobody has to pump you up to praise God. Character precedes and predetermines your performance. Martin Jones said Christians, by being Christians, 
influence society almost automatically. Indeed, you can make a difference in this world just by being who you are. Just be salt. Act like a Christian. Conduct yourself as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And what does that look like in practical terms? Jesus described the God-blessed, Christ-exalting, and kingdom-focused life in Matthew chapter 5. Verses 3 to 12. It is to be poor in spirit, to mourn, to be meek, to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to be peacemakers, to rejoice in undeserved persecution, to be the salt of the earth is to live in such a way that your life makes the gospel of Jesus Christ more attractive to the lost world. And the good news is that God uses salt. That is, God uses ordinary things. And aren't you glad Jesus didn't describe those he uses as gold of the earth or the silver of the earth or the jewels of the earth because most of us would not fit or be fit to represent the kingdom of heaven. But God in his sovereign grace uses ordinary people like you and me. First Corinthians chapter one verses 26 through 29 says, for consider your calling brothers not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, nor many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Thank God he uses salt. That means God can use you and me. God can use you with great talents or without great talents. God can use you without even a seminary degree or a college degree. God can use you without a lot of money without social prominence, even without physical beauty. God can use anybody. The question is, have you struggled to find your spiritual gift? Be encouraged and know that God's personnel department has a wide variety of available jobs. Jesus told us to be the salt of the earth, and there are some 14,000 industrial uses for salt. That's a lot of possibilities. All God needs of you in order to use you is all of you. And the good news is that God can use you. God wants to use you. In fact, God will use you. In John 15, 8, Jesus said, by this my father is glorified, that ye bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. In other words, it's God's will to use you. Joni Erickson writes, frankly, I think we're being redundant to ask God to use us. We're requesting him to do something he already desires to do. So if God is not using you to influence this world for his glory, it's not because he doesn't want to use you, but it might be because you have not made yourself useful. You may not have made yourself usable. You may not have made yourself available. Suppose you buy a house or a building and the former owner comes to you with the keys. Now there are 12 rooms in the house 
but he only gives you the keys to six rooms. So you ask the question, where are the other keys? And then the owner says, or the former owner says, oh, yes, you can't have them. There are some rooms I don't want you to see. There are some things I don't want you to move. And of course, your reply, but I purchased the whole house and I want all the keys. Watch this. Well, likewise, God cannot use you if you don't make yourself totally available to him. So sometimes God will start shaking up things in your life to make you useful. You are the salt of the earth, but God cannot use you to influence the world for the kingdom if you never get out of the salt shaker. So there are times when God has to take you out of your comfort zone, turn your life upside down, and start shaking things up in order to make you usable for his glory. Matthew 5, 13, again, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under men's feet. After describing his followers as the salt of the earth, Jesus raises a dilemma. He says, what if the salt has lost its savor? What if, what if? The salt is no longer salty. And at this point, commentators, they scramble to rescue Jesus. Because, you know, salt is a stable compound. It never loses its taste. But commentators, determined to protect Jesus from reproach, they explain that the salt made in the granaries near the Dead Sea were actually unstable and could lose its saltiness if adulterated by other substances. And when this happened, they say the salt would be tossed out as useless and trampled under the feet of those who passed along the way. You know, that sounds interesting. But that kind of cultural reinterpretation of the text gives Jesus protection that he may not want. Because I think Jesus intentionally turned this word picture on his head to make an essential point about the kingdom influence his followers are to have in this world. And here it is. Salt is different. Salt is different. Salt is different. And for salt to influence the taste of food, watch this, it must first have intimate contact with it. So much so that the salt dissolves and disappears as it infiltrates the food. But even though the salt becomes so thoroughly entrenched in the food, you know there's salt in it because the presence of salt makes the food taste different. But what use would it be? Or what use would it serve to put salt on food if it tastes no different? What good is salt that is not different? If salt becomes tasteless, what do you do? This ridiculous scenario is meant to be a divine warning about the great contradiction and severe consequences of worldliness in the believer's life. Watch this. Suppose a person accidentally left on the kitchen counter just before leaving on vacation. He left a steak on the counter. And they were gone for a month. And upon returning home, they would be welcomed with the horrendous odor They would stumble to the kitchen trying to imagine what could cause such a stench. And when finding the meat, they would not blame the meat for being a rotten slab of beef. He would kick himself for failing to preserve the meat 
in the refrigerator. And unfortunately, we Christians are often not that logical in our response to this sinful world. We make plenty of negative comments and vent great frustrations over the rotten society. But our culture is simply doing what comes naturally. As hard as it is to admit, we should, we should quit leveling blame of decadence on pagans and start asking why the church is not more effective in preventing decay from settling in this world. And the only way we can make a difference is if our lives demonstrate the difference that Jesus Christ makes in our life. Because it does matter how you conduct your life each day. It matters how you treat your neighbor. It matters how you act on your job. It matters how you manage your material possessions. It matters how you respond to trials and to temptations. Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the feet of men. And notice the severe consequences for losing one's saltiness. Jesus said, you are good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled under the feet of men. And think about that. Some things that lose their original purpose can still be used. But for other things, you cannot do that with salt. There is no such thing as recycled salt. Unsalty salt is worthy. It's worthless. It's worthless. One rabbi at the end of the first century was asked how one could make saltless salt salty again. He replied that one should salt it with the afterbirth of a mule. The problem with this answer is that mules are sterile. But that was the rabbi's point. Moreover, that is the warning of the Lord Jesus issues to normal world and unsinful people and unfruitful disciples. Luke 14, 34 and 35 says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. And he who hears or has ears, let him hear. A disciple who does not live like a disciple is worth about as much as tasteless salt or invisible light. Y'all know I got whooped on this first, don't you? And this warning about the peril of unsalty salt should lead us to examine our profession of faith. Because salvation comes when you repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. It has nothing to do with anything that you do. It's all about what God has done for us through the righteous life and substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Salvation comes to those who put their faith in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sin. But true assurance of salvation does not come by merely remembering some day in the past when you professed faith in Jesus Christ. And it does not come by tallying up all the religious things that you do. True assurance 
comes as God conforms you into the image of his son by the dynamic work of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 declares, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. More than just remembering the day when you walked down the aisle and gave the preacher your hand. You ought to be looking into the mirror of God's word to see if there's evidence of real change taking place in your life. And let me close with a word to unbelievers and a word to believers. A word to unbelievers. Maybe you have refused to accept Christ because of the way you've seen Christians live. Church people are just hypocrites, you might say. But let me tell you that Jesus Christ is not a hypocrite. And as long as he is who he said he is, and as long as he did what he said he did, he is worthy of your trust, your love, your worship, your servants, and obedience. John 14, 6, Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So look to Jesus to be saved. And unlike salt, too much of Jesus will not make you sick. To the contrary, old folk, you say he gets sweeter and sweeter as the day go by. Now, a word to the believers. Jesus warns his followers about the consequences of failing to be the salt of the earth. And the severe consequences are that you will not be able to influence others for the kingdom. In fact, just the opposite takes place. You are thrown out and trampled under people's feet. But notice that it is people who will reject you, not Jesus. If you fail to be what God calls you to be, you rob yourself of the opportunity to be a godly influence in the lives of others. And people may want to have nothing to do with you, but that doesn't mean that is how God will treat you. God majors in using people who are good for nothing. And the emphasis of the text is not the warning. It is the calling. You are the salt of the earth. And the message of the text is that the Lord has placed a calling on your life. Because the Lord believes in you. An artist went to visit a dear friend, and when he arrived, she was weeping, and he asked her why, and she showed him a handkerchief of exquisite beauty that had a great sentimental value to her, which had been ruined by a drop of indelible ink. And the artist asked her to let him have the handkerchief, which he returned to her by mail several days later. And when she opened the package, she could hardly believe her eyes. The artist, using the ink block as a base, had drawn on the handkerchief a design of great beauty with special ink. Now the handkerchief was more beautiful and more valuable than ever. And sometimes, beloved, the tragedies that break our hearts can become the basis for a more beautiful design in our lives. Because we are the salt. We are the salt. That means we have a job to do. It ain't just on the deacons. It ain't just on the mothers. 
It ain't just on the preachers. It's everybody's responsibility to be the salt of the earth. All of us must carry our weight as salt and do and be about the business of Jesus Christ in changing this world. Even if it's just one person at a time. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's our job. You are the salt. God, he never said you will be salt. You might have a chance of being salt. No, you are the salt. So get busy flavoring. Get busy seasoning. And get busy changing the taste of the people in this world from worldliness to godliness. That's our mandate. That's what we are called to do. And we must be about our father's business. Because all of us want to one day hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been the salt that I called you to be. Well done. You have been the influencer that I have called you to be. Well done. You have caused people to see me. To see the goodness that I share with the world. Well done. You have caused people to change. Well done. We must be about our father's business. And watch this. You know, they have salt substitutes. A lot of folk are operating as salt substitutes. Watch this. Thinking that they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. But when you sometimes examine those substitutes, you find that they do more harm than they do good. Don't be no substitute. Don't be no Mrs. Dash. Don't be no Creole seasoning. Be salt. The salt that God has called us to be. And watch this. In being salt, that means sometimes you can influence somebody and you may not even see it. Because you know you put salt on food, salt dissolves. Yeah. We don't see the cooks in these kitchens adding salt to the food, but when we get it, we know it's there, don't we? And it's good. And we never know the name of the cook that prepared the food. All we say is, ooh, that food was show sure seasoned good. We are the salt. Let's get busy salting. Amen. Amen. I want to extend the invitation. There may be one here today who has not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We invite you to come come and accept him as Lord come and allow him to rule and super rule over your life if that's you, you have the opportunity to come today and you may have said well I've done that, I came and 
I gave the preacher my hand and I gave God my heart, but I went back out in the world and started doing my own thing. And I want to know, can I come back to the fold? Is there room? Well, the answer is yes. You can come. You want to be a part of this ministry, you can come by letter, Christian experience, a candidate for baptism. Whether you're seated in the sanctuary or you're viewing us via Facebook, if that's you today, Give us a call and let us know that you've made the decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or that you've made the commitment to rededicate yourself back to God. That you too want to be an influencer. You want to be salt. The salt that Jesus has called for you to be. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and to grant you all his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That took a whole lot to preach. Yeah, because I said ouch a many a times. Because, you know, before I give it to y'all, God gives it to me. And he, I get whooped first several times. We got to be salt, y'all. We got to be the salt. This world is going to hell in a handbasket. And shame on us. Those of us who are Christians sit back and say, well, let somebody else deal with it. I heard old wise man say the hardest person, the hardest working person in the world is that one called nobody. Yeah, yeah. We got to be somebody and do what God called for us to do. Amen. We're going to hear our announcements now from Sister Sherry Lynn. Good morning, everyone. The St. Thomas MV Church Women Ministry presents, and this is to everyone, men and women, Thoughts That Conquer Mind, Body, Soul Workshop. During this workshop, you will learn to define thoughts and identify negative thought patterns how thoughts impact our overall health, strategies for overcoming a negative thought life. This will be at the St. Thomas Family Life Center. It will be Saturday, April the 1st, 2023. Our uh, Lady Debbie McGee is the hostess, and the guest speaker is Denise J. Gaines. From Intergy, the licensed St. Thomas area will be cut off Thursday, March the 2nd from 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock p.m. Okay. There will be a trash pickup March the 18th from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Large items, no paint, no tires, no household items. And we have an event, and I think it's next Sunday, March the 5th. Yeah. And everybody know what that is, right? Yeah. Yes. We, have, we will be celebrating Pastor Daryl L. McGee Sr. and Sister and Lady Debbie McGee, uh, 15th anniversary. Yeah. Yay. The guest speaker will be Reverend Robert M. Yancey from St. Paul Baptist Church, Arlington, Virginia. All right, so I'm going to see everybody here on March the 5th for this wonderful event. And I think Pastor say, dinner will be served. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you guys for the announcements. Amen. Thank you, Sister Shirley. Listen, and that, that announcement about the the women's or the conference in April, uh, very, very good conference that's going to happen because mental illness is real. 
and, and people, people are suffering uh, in silence. Uh, listen, just as people have diabetes and high blood pressure and all this other kind of stuff, people have mental illness. Yeah. yeah. So let go of the stigma uh, of mental illness. It is real. And people are dealing with issues, uh, and some don't know how to deal with those issues. And so this workshop is going to help uh, in, in those areas, in specific areas of dealing with uh, mental illness. Because it happens. We got people who may smile, but they're crying on the inside. Yeah, yeah. Also, Sister Burns got an announcement, I know, for coming up for... Yes, man. So hold on. Get this, get this mic. No, they can't hear you on TV. I just want to say to our members, anyone who's going to Natchez to the uh, conference, we want you to sign up today in the office or call tomorrow if you don't have it ready today. Your, your signing up doesn't mean you have to call and sign up. The church is signing for you. So when you go, you're already signed in. So all you need to do is go and be present there and sign up in the office today. And if we have enough people going, we can take the van. Okay, we can have transportation for you, no doubt. Pay your dinners or whatever. Pastor, pay your dinner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'd like to have enough people going to represent. Okay. Huh? huh? What about them? You got some more Girl Scout cookies? Oh, okay. Yes, listen, let me, let me say, yeah, if you want to go, uh, we encourage you to go on this trip to, down to Natchez. It's going to be good class going on. And, again, we have enough people. We can take the van down there. And uh, we're looking at providing, preferably providing lunch uh, for everybody. And the van will be leaving that morning and coming back that afternoon. Uh, this is not a, a trip to go down there and, and you know, shopping and all that. No, this is class. Yeah, so we'll be having class. Also, again, if you want some Girl Scout cookies, uh, see the Girl Scouts after service. They still got some more cookies. Let's see Sister Ward. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we closed on Monday. You can call and leave a message, but we'd like to know today, hopefully, if, if you want to go, if you want to go. Yeah, so we can have that number down. All right? All right. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Smith, yes. running against David Archie. Yes, sir. Okay, all right, Hines County District Number Two, two Supervisor. Yes. All right, all right. Well, good to have you here with us today. Yes. Thank you for showing up and putting a face with the name. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been several things here before. Okay. Live right down the street. All right. You know, I can't remember everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you all so much for coming and sharing with us today. Uh, we pray God's richest blessing upon you. We will have Bible study this week. We ain't done yet, y'all. We will have Bible study this week uh, on Wednesday, 12 noon via Zoom. Please join us if you can. Uh, be prayerful for uh, those who are on our sick and shut-in list. Sister Dolores Palmer was in the hospital. She's back home now. Uh, Brother Roosevelt Lewis was in the hospital. I have not heard an update on him as of late. Uh, well, not this week anyway. So, uh, But the last I saw him, he was doing good in the hospital. He was there for some tests. Uh, but we're going to continue to pray for him. Also be in prayer for Sister Regina Burks. She's going to have knee surgery uh, this Friday. This Friday. So she's going to be out for a little bit, 
dealing with her knee. She ain't going to be here for the anniversary, but she, we know she's going to tune in and send her money. <laughs> Amen. So just remember her this Friday as uh, she make ready to uh, do that. We're also grateful to have someone who is working with us uh, in our uh, culinary area uh, who has so graciously accepted to be a part of that and to assist us. We bring a wealth of experience and knowledge and that's Sister Julia Sly. We're thankful for her and giving her expertise. Uh, yeah. She knows how to do it and get the job done. Now, watch this. Let me, let me just tell you. Uh, Sister Sly is a sweet person. Just don't cross her. <laughs> now, now, because when she, watch this now, and we're going to get ready to get out of here. When she's doing business, it's about business. It ain't personal. It's business. So if she says, get out the kitchen and sit down somewhere, just get out the kitchen and sit down somewhere. It's not personal. It's just business, and that's the way we like it. Amen. Because we like, listen, God expects excellence in our service, and that's what we want to give him. Amen? Amen. Amen. I think that's all. We can stay. If you're happy, say amen. If you're happy and you know it, say. communion of his Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with each of us, now, henceforth, and forever, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people sang together. God bless you. We'll see you next week.